Hey everybody, thanks for checking out today's Multiphonic A Day video. My name is Ben, I'm a bassoonist based in Chicago, and I've been making and posting one of these videos every day that I'm in self-isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is Friday, April 3rd. This is day 20 of my self-isolation, and today is episode 18 of Multiphonic A Day. So today, instead of focusing on a specific multiphonic, I'm going to talk a little bit about tablature notation, which is a method of writing down multiphonics that I've encountered in a number of different contemporary pieces. If you've seen any of the videos where I show examples from Bellone or from Chris Fisher Lockhead, you've seen at least snippets of what tablature notation can look like. And I want to talk a little bit about my experience learning pieces like this, how I've approached it, what I see as the advantages and disadvantages of tablature notation. And of course, I'm going to play a couple of examples from different composers to show you what I'm talking about. So just kind of to frame this discussion, most of the time when we think about playing music, we think about it being represented in what's called either standard or staff notation. And what that means is that the composer has notated the sounding result that they want to hear. So if they want to hear a G2, they would put, say, a quarter note on the bottom line of the bass clef staff. And then I, as a performer, with my knowledge of bassoon fingerings and embouchure and air support and so on and so forth, I would then take the necessary steps on my instrument to produce that sounding result. So this is, of course, a gross oversimplification, but the basic relationship is that the composer, composer dictates what should be the ultimate sounding result, and then the performer uses their knowledge and their capability on the instrument to make that happen. And that system of notation is really great at doing a number of things. I mean, it's very good at uh, notating specific pitches, at least within the equal tempered system. We've gotten very good at notating rhythms in that way and things like that. We start to get into trouble with that kind of notation when we get into the zone of multiphonics because that notation doesn't have a lot to say about timbre, for example, or about changing armature pressure to bring out different partials and things like this. So these are all concepts that are vital to the performance of multiphonics, at least on the bassoon but they don't exist within the scope of what this notation is capable of. And so there are a number of different solutions that I've seen composers taking that include, uh, you know, devising new systems of using square note heads or diamond note heads to indicate adding or subtracting certain keys, um, systems of, you know, putting a lot of text above to describe uh, what's supposed to be done in order to get this multiphonic out. And a lot of the time composers will notate still the sounding result of the multiphonic, but then in the performance notes before the score, they'll give specific fingerings and directions for how they should be achieved. And that all works very well to a certain point. I find that with, you know, up to maybe, say, 10 multiphonics, it's very possible to communicate effectively the information that you need without devising a whole new system of notation in order to represent that. The problem is that once you get outside of that, and many of the composers whose music I love and play and am most interested in are far beyond just this limited collection of multiphonics, then you get into trouble and you have to have a way to represent more specific changes where the information is contained within the score. Because many of these composers, in addition to using a lot of different multiphonics, many of which have very complex fingerings that are difficult to remember, in addition to that, there are also making small variations to these multiphonics to achieve timbral changes. So as you've seen in some of the other videos, you can make huge changes just by adding and subtracting one or two keys. You can make huge changes by moving your placement of the embouchure on the reed, by increasing or decreasing your embouchure pressure or your air support. And so these are all things that if the type of sounding result that you're trying to get is very specific in terms of these different variations, on a wide variety of different multiphonics, there has to be a way to represent that within the score itself so that it's performable in real time and legible in real time to performers. And that's where I think that tablature notation becomes really effective. So generally, if you've heard of tablature notation just generically, you've probably heard of it on the guitar, right? We have guitar tabs that show you where to place your fingers on the strings to produce different chords. And the fundamental concept is the same with tablature notation on the bassoon. The idea is basically that instead of notating the sounding result, the action itself is being notated. So within the score, you're being told, 
which fingers to press down, which keys should be depressed, when to open certain keys, and so on and so forth. And this expands the possibilities for notating really specific changes to multiphonics and a wide variety of complex multiphonics that it makes it possible to do within the score. So what does that look like? Generally, it always, at least I should say in my experience with those pieces that I've played, it involves a pictorial representation of the keywork of the bassoon, usually placed above the staff, and there, generally speaking, is also a second staff, sometimes more than one secondary staff, as I'll show you in a couple of these pieces, that's showing at least a rough representation of what the sounding, intended sounding result will be. And this, I think, is really important because of the variability of a lot of these multiphonics. As you've heard, many of them, with a slight adjustment of air pressure, of embouchure pressure, and so on and so forth, can cause a really striking change in the sound that comes out. So in addition to giving a fingering and sometimes instructions on embouchure placement and so on and so forth, composers, I think, are really smart to put a rough representation of what they want the sounding result to be in there so that the performer, when learning the piece, can have some confirmation that they're doing the right thing. Or if they're not doing the right thing, that they can have a certain audible goal to reach for. So I'm going to show examples of three different pieces, and I'll talk a little bit about what's, go what's going on in each of these. Uh, the first one is a piece that, if you've been watching these videos, you've seen several times. This is Lenio Edra II, Edra, by Pierluigi Bologna. And Bologna, I think, is uh, one of the first composers to really go in deep with a bassoon tablature to achieve a really vast world of sounds. So I'm going to show an example here from the second page of the score that I think illustrates really well how this kind of notation works and also why it's effective. So I'll throw that up on, on the screen now. And as you can see here, right at the beginning, we have a fingering above the staff. We have a grand staff, so a bass clef and a treble clef staff. And then on top, we have a diagram that represents the fingering system of the bassoon. This is similar to the fingerings that I've shown in all the other videos. And you can see here it's giving me basically instructions where to put all of my fingers. And already here, with the very first sonority in this example, I think that the tablature system is necessary because it's kind of a strange fingering. You see in the left hand I have one, two, three. I play this entire piece with my whisper key lock on, by the way. And then in the, in the right hand I have two, three, and a B flat key and then this trill key with the right hand. And so if it wasn't for a specific pictorial representation of all these keys, I think the amount of text and explanation that it would take to explain this fingering alone, just this one, is so much that it's already worth it to put a picture in there. Although it does, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of composers who are worried about cluttering the score or there being, you know, these pictures of fingerings taking up too much room in the score, and I think that's a really valid concern. Because if you don't need to put that much information in, it does take up a lot of space. But in this case, um, just from that fingering alone, for me as a performer, I would much rather have a picture of it in there than an explanation. Because then you have to get into very terminology on the key work, and you have to you know make sure that you're getting the right key based on the composer's instructions, and so on and so forth. So this is a really simple way to just represent exactly what you're looking for. And then as you go along, you can see up here that there are keys that are being added and subtracted one by one from this bass fingering. So all we're seeing here along this line is those keys that are changing. So the bass fingering is staying the same, just certain keys are being added and subtracted from it. And then you can track that in the bottom step here in the bass clef with a representation of the sounding result, which is really helpful, like I said before, to ensure that the fingering changes that you're making, along with, you know, combined with the embouchure pressure that you're using and so forth, are producing the result that was intended. So I'm going to just play this passage for you once and then talk about it a little more. <laughs> 
acceleration of this one fingering with variations that accelerate and decelerate the beating as well as subtly changing the pitch of the bass fingering. And the reason that I think that tablature notation is so effective here is because the ways in which this fingering is being manipulated are so specific. And if I don't do them in the right order, or if I do, you know, for example, if I close one of those holes all the way instead of only part of the way, often the multiphonic will break in a way that totally disrupts the line. And so it's actually really important that those exact changes in fingering as they're represented there happen in the order that they're notated. And for that reason, I think it's essential to have that information within the score because there's no way really to remember that if it's in a note at the beginning of the score and then this happens on you know the second or third page of the piece. And for me, it's also just very helpful once I've gotten into the habit of being able to read this that I can just go through and actually read it as it's going on instead of having a level of abstraction there of trying to remember how to achieve the sounding result. So that you know the abstraction is taken away in that it's literally what I'm doing with the mechanism is in there. It's a direct relation to what the action that I'm taking. And then I still have sort of the abstracted layer of the sounding result below it to check in with. And I find that to be really, really helpful. So next I'm going to show a short excerpt from a piece by a composer named Jung Bong Lee. Uh, JB is a close friend and collaborator of mine and he, like Bologna actually, uh, bought a bassoon and taught himself how to play it and used his discoveries to create what I think is a really amazing language for the bassoon. He actually ended up devising this contraption to attach a foot pump to the bell of the bassoon by way of a long hose, which has some really amazing effects to the sound of the bassoon itself in general, and also creates some uh, exciting possibilities in terms of new multiphonics and also in terms of the action of the pump itself. Unfortunately, due to the self-isolation, I don't have that pump now, but this passage uh, works without it as well. So I'm gonna put up uh, this excerpt from JB's piece, Latent Inversion, which is for bassoon and string quartet. And you'll see here that in many ways it looks similar to the Bologna example that we just looked at. The elements that are the same are the top and the bottom, I would say. The top, just like in Bologna, is a representation of the keywork of the bassoon with bass fingerings maintaining with slight changes in fingering. So I'm looking at sort of the last eighth note of the first measure, measure 22, which gives you a bass fingering. And then throughout measure 23, there are fingers being added and subtracted. And then there's a representation of the sounding result on the grand staff, which is on the bottom. Now in the middle here, JP has actually added three more staffs to give really specific information about the placement of the embouchure on the reed, that's the bottom of the three, the opening of the mouth, so the, the jaw opening, and then also the pressure of the embouchure. So in, in his experimentation with the bassoon, he found that those were three parameters that were essential to be able to control in order to get some of these multifunctions to sound in the first place and also to get some of the variations that he was going for. So sometimes instead of changing the fingering, like if you look here, the first beat and a half that I'm going to play, which is the last eighth note of measure 22 and the first beat of measure 23, there's not actually any change in fingering happening in the tablature notation at the top. Instead, I'm increasing my embouchure pressure, which is the top of the three middle staves, and I'm moving my embouchure further up on the reed in order to get that upper note to sound. So just to show you what that specific thing sounds like, this, this is what's going on. So my fingers aren't moving at all. I'm just moving further up on the reed and then squeezing a lot more with my embouchure. And so he has found a way here to represent that within the score in a really specific way, which is necessary in order to get a lot of these things to sound the way that he intends. So I'm going to start at the pickup to measure 23, and I'll just play that measure there so you can hear what it sounds like. 
variations of the fingers that are going on. And in addition to that, at the same time, he's asking me to move up and down on the reed, to open and close my jaw, and then also to change my embouchure pressure, which is only at the beginning of that specific measure. And so this is a lot of information to deal with all at once. And I find that in playing these kinds of pieces, it takes me quite a while to be able to decipher everything because there's simply so much information being thrown at me. What I do find, though, is that once I get into the zone of being able to read it more effectively, I'm able to isolate that information that's essential for me. So in some of these cases, a lot of the stuff that's happening in the middle of the me measure, especially the indications of opening and closing my jaw, those have become intuitive for me in practicing these specific multiphonics and feeling their resistance and understanding through muscle memory what I have to do to get them to sound on time. And so even though there's a whole bunch of information on the page, I'm not necessarily needing to read everything in there once I've gotten to a point where I'm playing through the piece. It's more, you know, some of the information in there is vital in the early stages of understanding how to achieve these sounds. And then as I go on and get more experience with the piece and get to know it better, I'm able to focus in, hone in on specific things. Like for example, in this, I'm always focused on the rhythm within the bottom two staffs. And I keep an eye on the tablature all the time. And I often find myself circling certain changes in fingering that are not necessarily intuitive for me. And you know, making sure that there are, when there are things in the bass fingering especially that I tend to forget, that I draw my attention to that. So that to me is, the only real disadvantage of tablature notation is the fact that there's really so much information on the page at one time, and it can be daunting and hard to read at first. And that's something that I think is a reason for composers to con consider it carefully before using notation like this, because if it's possible to represent what you're trying to do in a more simple manner, it will be less work on the part of your performer to learn how to read it and how to be able to do it. But I find that if you're trying to show such specific and such wide-ranging changes in a piece, this kind of notation is the only kind that I've found is not limited at all in terms of the possibilities of what you're able to represent. It just does take a lot more time to read. And so finally, that takes me to my final example, which it wouldn't be a multiphonic of the David Yule unless I showed a little bit of grandfather. And this is another variation on the tablature notation. Another thing that, that I want to say is that Grandfather is the first piece that I learned that uses tablature notation, and it took me a really, really long time to be able to read it with any kind of fluidity. It was really kind of a process of rewiring my brain to understand the way that Chris was representing these changes on the page. But then, as I've gone on and learned more pieces that use tablature notation, even though there are slight variations on the system that Chris used, I found that each time it becomes easier to me because I have a baseline understanding of operating the mechanism of the bassoon in that way on the one hand, and also parsing out the information on the page to figure out what exactly is most useful for me. And so as I've gone along and learned more and more pieces that use this kind of notation, I found that it becomes more intuitive and it becomes easier for me to understand what's going on and easier for me to troubleshoot and problem solve in terms of identifying what are the things that are most essential for me to pay attention to and what are things that are helpful instructions in terms of achieving the sounds but are not necessarily essential as I'm performing the piece in real time. So I just want to briefly show uh, an image from the notes to this piece where Chris explains the elements of his tablature notation. There are some things that will look very familiar. Again, there's a pictorial representation of the keywork of the bassoon at the top. And here, Chris has added a visual aid that I think is actually really helpful in that when he asks the performer to subtract the key, there's a red line there for the duration that that key is subtracted. And when he asks for the performer to add a key or add uh, or close a hole, there's a green line. So in that example here, you can see that there are three times where holes are open, twice the first finger of the left hand, and once the second finger of the right hand. And those are all represented by the red lines. And then towards the end of the measure, there's the addition of the B flat key with the thumb, and that's what's represented by the green line there. Now he only has one 
staff at the bottom here. And that represents, in first, the first thing that it represents is it's a staff representation of the bass fingering. So the fingering at the beginning of this measure is a flat two, and so that's what he's notated there. And since there are no variations on it, that's actually also what sounds when you play that. And then as you add and subtract keys, that no longer is the sounding result, but it's maintained down there as the uh, bass fingering, just to show the duration that that is the fingering that all of these variations are based off of. And then in the very bottom, he has air pressure, which is in some ways a substitute for dynamics, but also has something to do with this precise changes in air pressure that you have to make in order to get different multiphonics to sound. So I'm going to play a short excerpt from one of the slower sections of this piece, uh, starting in cell 57. And I chose this one just um, so that it would be a little bit more apparent when uh, keys are being added and subtracted. And here he starts with a low F, F2, as the bass fingering. And as you can see, there are uh, fingers in the right hand that are lifted in the first half. And then eventually he starts adding the B flat key in this. And I think one of the things that I really love about this specific gesture is the way that it starts from the single tone, the low F, and has these variations on it, and then migrates up into the higher register of the bassoon, and then suddenly welcomes you back into this uh, single tone of the F with a G-flat trill at the end of it. So I'll just play the short excerpt from Grandfather. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope that it was informative and useful for you. This was kind of a, a crash course through some of my experiences with tablature notation. And if you have any questions, any requests, any comments, please let me know. And check in again tomorrow. I'll be back with some more multiphonics. Thanks.